Hello, everybody. Um, I think we're, we're still kind of letting people in. So we're just waiting a moment or two more. Um, welcome to, I don't know if you can see me, but uh, my name is Ali Fitzgibbon and I'm the subject lead for arts management and cultural policy here at Queen's. Um, so I'm just here to welcome you to this, our first seminar of 2021-22. I'm going to pass you over very quickly to my colleague, Dr. Kim Marie Spence, and just to say we have a number of seminars running this semester. Our next event is going to be on Monday, the 15th of November, um, which is our annual showcase of master's research. We also have an event on the 24th, which will take place, um, which is Tess Leminski talking about gender, ethnicity and Irish traditional music and further events which we will be advertising. All of them are on the AEL events website and we're delighted that today's event is going to be done jointly with uh, the School of Music events uh, or music events at Queen's. So it's a fantastic opportunity to look at kind of bringing the different subject areas together and hopefully having some interesting conversations. So I'm gonna pass over to Kim to introduce David. Um, thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the QUB AMCP series. I should also note that you can follow us on Twitter at QUB AMCP. Uh, today we're delighted to have um, David Arditi with us. He's an associate professor of sociology and director of the Center for Theory at the University of Texas at Arlington, that's in the US. Um, his research addresses digital technology and its impact on society and culture through the perspective of music and the music industry. Um, and today he speaks to us from his latest two books, um, Streaming Culture and Getting Signed Record Contracts, Musicians and Power in Society. And we, again, I must say, delighted to have him um, I'm Kim Marie Spence, um, a lecturer at AMCP. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Kim Marie. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, let me share my screen with everybody. And uh, All right, so thank you for attending this talk. And I'd like to thank Ali Fitzgibbon for inviting me. Um, from my conversations with Dr. Fitzgibbon, I understand Belfast is in the process of UNESCO certification as a city of music, and it is the sister city of Nashville, Tennessee. Much of my talk today is actually a product of research I conducted in Nashville. And on this topic of music cities, I want to highlight my own relationship with music cities first. I'm coming to you from the city of Arlington, Texas. Arlington has a population of 398,000 people, roughly the size of Belfast. However, Arlington sits in the geographic center of a 6.4 million person metropolitan area known as Dallas-Fort Worth, which is the uh, Sec second or third, I think it's the third largest metropolitan in the United States. It's often, Arlington's often overshadowed by Dallas. It's 1.3 million person neighbor city. But Arlington is the home of stadiums and sports team uh, that often, it often gets referred to as Dallas. As a result, Arlington is in a rebranding effort to be known as an entertainment capital. When Beyonce and Jay-Z went on tour, they played at Arlington's AT&T Stadium. Paul McCartney has played at AT&T Stadium and Globe Life Park, which is a baseball stadium here in Arlington. Um, quintessentially, the problem here, Taylor Swift's Netflix special Reputation Stadium Tour was filmed at AT&T Stadium here in Arlington, but the promotional materials say it was filmed in Dallas. We're also home to such music stars as Marin Morris, Post Malone, Pentatonix, and Pantera. Over the past year, Arlington became certified as with uh, 
become known as a music-friendly city by the Texas Music Office. And I'm a member of the city's music-friendly city board, and I'm working to grow its musical reputation. The name of my book is Getting Signed, Record Contracts, Musicians, and Power in Society. It is a product of 40 years of research, talking to musicians, wherever my travels took me, but also a reflection on 10 years of work as a gigging musician. Uh, as you can see, I've got my electronic drums back here. Uh, in this talk, I will walk you through the background of the project and turn to the shift in promotional strategies from gigging and live music venues to social media data. As a musician myself, I've always been interested in the dreams and aspirations of the people around me. This is a picture of me playing with a band I played with. We were kind of like uh, um, uh, Galactic or um, Soul Live. We played that kind of music. This is uh, the, the name of the band's Ethnic Detour. This is us around 2005. Um, I've got my little kid. We're playing at a place called Shisha. It was a hookah lounge. I've got my favorite drummer sitting behind me, Quest Love. Um, so through years of playing, I noticed a common theme among musicians that they wanted to sign record contracts. So here's an excerpt from the introduction to the book. In 2004, my band, Ethnic Detour, seen here, played a gig at Latitudes, which is another uh, venue. It's a small music venue at the Four Point Sheraton in Blacksburg, Virginia. While the show itself was otherwise ordinary, an experience speaking with the other band playing that night planted the germ in my head for this project. My band co-headlined this gig with a band from out of town. When they arrived, uh, they pulled up in a commercial van towing a trailer with their equipment, much like this picture here. This is just a generic picture. They displayed no interest in speaking with my band. As a drummer, I offered for their drummer to use my drum kit, which is a common courtesy to reduce time between acts, but he insisted on using his own kit. Of course, their band's name was plastered on his bass drum. From the moment they arrived, they started demanding the manager change the agreed upon co-headliner arrangement so they could headline. The other band insisted on headlining because they were in discussions with multiple labels. They were touring the East Coast of the United States to build their credibility for a better deal. My band agreed to play first since we would split the door anyway. However, since the crowd showed up to see my band, most left after we finished our set. Although the band was unremarkable, they probably signed a record contract with a label. Assuming they did, they most likely recorded an album, at which point they would be lucky to have the label pay enough attention to their project to promote and market it. They would be even luckier if they recouped their advance. Record contracts are notoriously exploitative of artists who sign away their copyrights in exchange for the potential to make it big. Although it is widely acknowledged that record contracts only on rare occasions equal big time monetary success, the desire remains strong among bands and recording artists to sign unequitable record contracts. This project addresses the following questions. In what way does the desire to sign recording contracts change the way labels treat musicians? How pervasive is the ideology of getting signed? Why are musicians willing to sell the rights to their music in exchange for an advance to record an album? Why do they desire to record, or why do they desire a record contract? How does assigning a record contract materially affect the parties of the, in the agreement? This band is one example of a widespread desire in the cultural imaginary, wherein a record contract signifies great achievement, whether that's celebrity, wealth, or status. So that's the end of that quote. Um, when I started the project, I wanted to understand why do musicians want to sign record contracts? I knew record contracts were exploitative, and as musicians lasted longer in the industry, their desire declined after, to sign one uh, after learning the reality. As I did my research, the question didn't interest me as much as the way the desire proliferates in society more generally. 
So how does the ideology of getting signed permeate society to convince musicians to sign record contracts? Getting signed explores the desire, which I call the ideology of getting signed. Regardless of genre, aspiring musicians dream of signing a record contract. While this may have different meanings across class, race, and gender lines, many musicians possess the feeling that a record contract will make them rich and famous. I call this, again, the ideology of getting signed, which is a social phenomenon that exists outside individuals and persists across time. Furthermore, the ideology exists throughout society as the major aspirational achievement that non-musicians expect musicians to pursue. There is a widespread belief among non-musicians and aspiring musicians that these record contracts bring incredible wealth to anyone who signs one because of the large sums of money earned by a few artists, a few that I mentioned earlier uh, when I was talking about the city of Arlington. Non-musicians and musicians alike internalize the ideology of getting signed. Non-musicians, uh, encourage musicians to pursue these contracts, and musicians believe that record contracts will bring them wealth and fame. And this permeates uh, society, especially American society everywhere. Um, of course, you see this with people in acting. Um, I worked uh, on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. for a while, and people uh, were on the internship hustle to try to um, get jobs in nonprofits and in, in Congress and, and, and doing all these different things. So you, you see it everywhere. It's this thing where you have to do something to, to get in position, uh, to, to get a job. Um, and you see it everywhere. Um, so my approach uh, to analyze the ideology of getting signed, I deploy several methods, but my guiding methodology is in the critical theoretical tradition. In that tradition, I view in Timothy W. Luke's words, uh, quote, political behaviors, social forces, institutional structures, and cultural activities as densely encoded but largely decodable texts. Um, and I guess uh, I should add to this that I'm a cultural studies scholar. While I work in a sociology department, my PT, PhD is in cultural studies, um, and, and that's the tradition I tend to work in. So as such, I use what Robert Antonio describes as imminent critique, quote, a means of detecting the societal contradictions which offer the most determinate possibilities for emancipatory change, unquote. Ideological formations present themselves as natural, but underlying this presentation lies a hidden reality that seeks to strengthen the political economic system. This is my attempt to peel back some of those layers that obscure the ideology of getting signed. The project stems partly from ethnographic observations in several settings where I was a participant of observer who occasionally interviewed other participants. Over three years, I attended local shows in 20 cities, went to musicians' meetups in the Dallas-Fort Worth region, sought people who have varying contacts with the rec recording industry, and experienced the music scene in whatever city my academic and personal travels guided me to. Atlanta, Georgia, Quebec in Montreal, or, or Quebec in, in Canada, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Nashville, Seattle, Austin, Texas, Dallas, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, and of course, Arlington, Texas, where I live, among others. Several times I attended musician showcases and competitions. These were frenzied occasions where I received a heavy dose of the ideology. But most importantly, I went to shows. That's how I do my research, because I think live music is the backbone of uh, music. Um, so quite often I would just go to local, see lo primarily local music uh, wherever I could and hang out at the bars and uh, talk to fans, talk to musicians, just do whatever I could. So record contracts are the tangible goal, but playing live is what musicians most often do. That is 
what being a musician is all about. So at shows, I observed the performers in the crowd, spoke to people working at the venue, the musicians, their management, and listeners. I also met with museum curators, family of signed acts, musicians themselves, label executives, venue executives, and everyone in between. These conversations ranged from brief encounters to three-hour interviews. However, my ethnographic approach does not posit that research subjects provide eternal truths. Rather, I view ethnography through a critical theoretical lens as, quote, a way of seeing and a, and a form of knowing that employs historical knowledge, reflexive reasoning, and ironic awareness to give people some tools to realize new potentials for the emancipation and enlightenment of ordinary in individuals today. That's another quote from Tim Leith. In other words, I read ethnographic texts with the same skeptical eye I use to read any other text. Uh, my position as an insider provides me with the critic or the unique ability to decode these texts. This process is both textual and interpretive. For this reason, a different researcher may take different interpretations from the same text. By interpreting the text in everyday life, critical theory aims to disturb power and domination. My interrogation of the ideology of getting signed illuminates how the everyday taken for granted use of record contracts creates the space for, allows for, and it perpetuates the exploitation of musicians. I'll briefly go over the kind of overview of the book, and then I'll focus on um, a bit of chapter four. I'm going to uh, read a passage from it. So I structured getting signed in two parts. Part one emphasizes the theoretical underpinnings of the ideology of getting signed. And part two, I build my argument by presenting cases that I observed through my ethnographic work. Um, so Chapter one is an introduction. Uh, I read that that's that passage from the beginning, and I and I try to define um, the ideology ideology of getting signed. But as we get into part two or part one and chapter two, uh, record contracts, ideology, and action, I look at how ideology operates in society, and I, I give my theoretical understanding of ideology. At the same time, that I go into further description of how record contracts operate. Um, chapter three, uh, copyright enclosure. I describe the way that copyright acts uh, much the way that land enclosure worked in England um, as described by Karl Marx. Uh, so it creates this kind of property, um, quote unquote, intellectual property. And that's the way and that's the mechanism through which musicians can be exploited. Without it, I argue, it's difficult to exploit musicians because they own their own means of uh, production most often. Uh, chapter four, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about this, the digital turn, music business as usual. Basic idea is people always come up to me and go, oh, but everything's different because of uh, digital technology. When in reality, nothing's changed. People still want to sign record contracts, even when they don't uh, have to. Like Lil Nas X was huge without signing a record contract, um, but he signed it anyway. And, they, you know, they gave him a few million dollars to, to come on board so they could exploit him. Um, chapter five is on competition in music. And in this, I look at different ways that competition manifests itself um, from you know, my own experience, starting in fifth grade playing music, you do chair tests. Uh, so who's first chair, who's second chair? And um, I also talk about battle of bands. And, and so just the way competition really is everywhere. Part two gets into those case studies. Uh, chapter six is we're getting the band back together. We're getting the band back together. Uh, comes from the popular phrase from Blues Brothers. Um, and it, it looks at the way cohesion works in, in bands and, and the kind of forces that uh, try to rip apart a band and ultimately succeed at that. Chapter seven is an analysis of the television show, The Voice. They have these brands in every country now. Um, 
Uh, so I look at the way um, the voice sells the ideology of getting signed uh, to everybody out there. Chapter eight, conning the dream. I actually went to a showcase where they were doing pay to play. Um, probably the most messed up chapter of the book is chapter eight. I strongly recommend taking that up or taking a read of that because um, I had no idea that people were being charged 100, I think it was $150 to go perform at this showcase that travels around the United States. There's two arms of it. They plan to go to cities every, every day. Um, and there's nothing to win. And it, it, so I describe it as a confidence game. Um, and then of course the conclusion where uh, I, I describe where I see things going and, and, and ways to fix this problem. All right. So this excerpt from chapter four. from bar gigs to social media. Even though digital technology has disrupted the music industry, it has done so only in terms of the way labels conduct business, not as a way to subvert the business itself. The utopian vision of the internet misses the point. While Chris Anderson's long tail, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, made waves among the utopian circuit that the internet makes cultural content available to all, Anderson fails to see that gatekeepers play an important role in filtering infinite content to audiences. As I demonstrate elsewhere, the major labels play an increased role providing power to connect musicians to listeners. When people introduce new technologies, there is often a utopian impulse that the world will change as a result and bring change in the form of democracy and liberation. Excuse me. And all you have to do is look at international elections around the world and see that that's not what digital technology has done. In this case, digital technology would liberate fans and musicians from the oppressive record label regime. However, all new technologies are embedded in society and contain all of the societal baggage that always already exists. For the present moment, anything that exists on the internet exists in society. And we should expect that the uses to which the internet is deployed will conform to society. Since the internet exists in a capitalist society, capitalists will find ways to increase profits using new technologies. Here, I consider the way that finding and profiting from talent has changed in the recent past. There is a long held truism in the recording industry that musicians have to do your time performing before a record label will sign them. The basic idea is that musicians have to spend time playing gigs at the local level to build up a following. Over time, musicians will begin to book gigs at larger venues as their fan base grows. Eventually, buzz builds around the act and label artist and repertoire A&R representatives will begin to take notice. At that point, musicians begin discussions with A&R reps about potential contracts. Typically, those A&R reps want to see that the musicians have the potential to sell albums. A&R reps want to see the numbers. They want hard data. Historically, the data could be any of the following. Attendance at shows, regional and national touring, press coverage, mailing or email lists, uh, album sales or more merchandise sales. Regional and national touring demonstrate to the label a level of commitment to in playing professionally. Uh, this is not different from the shark tanks on or sharks on Shark Tank ridiculing a contestant for not quitting their job. So those of you in the US, if you're not familiar with Shark Tank, uh, they get all these uh, multi-millionaires and, and one billionaire, Mark Cuban, who's actually from Dallas, Texas. Um, and they, they, they're venture capitalists, they have people pitch things to them. And one of the constant refrains is, well, have you quit your day job? Um, there's this expectation that people would quit their day job to pursue their dream. Meanwhile, right, uh, the, the sharks, this is only part of what they do. They, don't, they have their own day job and they're not dedicating all their time to promoting a product. Um, so there's an irony there, and that's exactly what happens in the music industry. So the shark investors want to know, 
The people running a business do not timidly approach their business. Likewise, labels want to see commitment from the musicians and if the musicians have day jobs. Labels cannot tell if they are 100% committed. Many musicians sell their music at shows. In hip hop, a popular expression was to sell music out the trunk of a quote of a car. Or in the case of a band like Dave Matthews Band uh, from my home state, Virginia, musicians set up their own label and tour the college circuit, selling albums and creating an email list. In each case, A&R reps want to see that musicians hustle, and they figure that a hustler will continue to work hard for them. In the do-your-time approach to record contracts, there are echoes of the Protestant work ethic described uh, by Weber in, Max Weber, in which, quote, the essence of this philosophy of avarice, uh, he's talking about uh, Ben Franklin, is the idea of the duty of the individual to work toward the increase of his wealth, which is assumed to be an end in itself, unquote. Musicians have to exhibit, uh, continuing with Weber, quote, an attitude which in the pursuit of a calling strives system systematically for profit for its own sake, unquote. In context of the ideology of getting signed, musicians must show a restless desire to maximize economic output, resist idleness in the terms of uh, Ben Franklin, and that they subsumed capitalist ideology. Only then would labels consider signing an act. The above conventional approach to signing a record contract changed with social media and streaming music not by reversing the norms, but rather by hyper-emphasizing data. By using systems of surveillance on the internet, record labels can extract data, not just on consumption and demographics, which become even more data rich in the digital environment, but also by using tracking cookies and following consumers across sites. These data allow record labels to access and assess real-time information about music trends, fan bases, and profitability. So here's kind of an abstract example. Um, labels can identify that a rock band is popular among 22-year-old women in Denton, Texas. Denton, Texas is kind of a, a cool music town near here. Uh, it's where the University of North Texas is. They have a huge um, jazz performance program. They may also find out that those women like to drink mojitos from local bar data and that they are social act activists who read Ms. Magazine and spend a lot of time tweeting about politics. The drink information can be pulled by mining credit card information. They can figure out the Ms. Magazine connection by using tracking cookies and the Twitter information by paying for Twitter marketing data. A label could use this information to send this band that the that these women like to Denton recruit Bacardi as a sponsor of the tour and encourage the band to participate in a progressive protest or attend a rally while they are in town because that makes it even more on brand right so in order to find a band to sign the labels uh, can use the same data to work in the opposite direction by examining geotag information about popular independent artists who are streamed in a sp specific location. Recruiting becomes a factor of access to data instead of a gut feeling by a and uh, reps. On, on the one hand, this disturbs the power of specific gatekeepers. On the other hand, it rationalizes the creative process by emphasizing hard data over aesthetic judgment. Earlier in the book, I mentioned a conversation uh, with, a, with a guy I call Emmanuel. He was a booker in Nashville, um, and he booked for multiple venues. And, and to give you kind of a context about how Nashville works, if uh, you haven't been there before, they have a million bars, and it keeps growing. Uh, so there's a road called Broadway, and on Broadway, uh, every bar has live music, like, all day. And some of the bars have two to three venues within the one bar. 
Um, so you can, and none of them charge, or very few of them charge admission. So you can just go from bar to bar. And they only play cover tunes. They play country music. I'm not a big fan of country music. I love Nashville. It's super fun to go walk from bar to bar and find something that's good um, and see people playing out their heart. Um, but they're just playing cover tunes. And actually, uh, the, when I was there most recently for this research, it had really grown. There had been about six bars, and now the, it, it, it's just massive. And it's become uh, the bachelorette capital of the United States, the bachelorette party uh, capital of the United States. So that's kind of a little weird, too. Um, as a married man walking around, it, it's just kind of weird seeing people like, oh, I'm going crazy. But you kind of forget about that and focus on, on the music. And it, it's great. So this guy books these shows. Um, so in our conversation, he kept uh, discussing what he called social media reach uh, with regard to his willingness to book an act. But this is also an important factor for record labels interested in signing an act. When labels explore signing an artist, they consider not only how many friends, followers, subscribers, et cetera, the artist has, but also the level of engagement of their followers. In other words, having 15,000 Twitter followers may demonstrate strength for a musician, but if they post a new song and receive 10 likes and five retweets, it indicates that their followers may not pay attention to them. Furthermore, Labels can access the number of link clicks and media engagements on Twitter, which provides even more data about the connection between the artists and their followers. A label would prefer to see an artist with only 2,000 followers, but every time they tweet a song, it receives 1,000 likes, 500 retweets, and 10,000 media engagements. Um, and so one of the ironies, uh, uh, when I went there, when I was meeting with this guy, I was at a, a, a bar in the middle of the day, one of the venues he books at, and um, there was a fiddle player who plays with, oh, I just lost his name, um, is it Jack White from the White Stripes. So she's his touring fiddle, fiddle player, and she was incredible. And it was two o'clock in the afternoon, and there were like five people at this venue. Um, so that is the kind of love that she gets. She was she was great, um, but again, he didn't really care because she she plays second fiddle, so to speak. If anybody's aware of that idiom, um, anyway, here's the key difference to between the way record labels used to find talent and the way it works today. Instead of A&R reps combing local gigs to find unsigned artists, now they can turn to the trending stars on YouTube, SoundCloud, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. All right, so my conclusion here. Um, in the conclusion, I discussed some alternatives and the barriers to those alternatives. Um, one thing that I, I came across was uh, another, so I mentioned Chris Anderson in the long tail. He was uh, the editor of Wired when he came up, which is a tech magazine, uh, when he came up with this idea. Another mantra that a lot of musicians really buy into uh, was by the following editor of Wired music, uh, magazine by the name of Kevin Kelly. And Kevin Kelly talked about uh, 1,000 true fans. And the basic idea is that if a band had 1,000 true fans per uh, musician in the band and they got a true fan to spend $100 per person, that brings in 100,000 US dollars, um, which is roughly a euro um, and, and roughly a pound, a pound's worth um, a little bit more. But then they'd have $100,000 a year, which is a great salary. You know, you, you, you got to take some of that off because it might be merchandise. Uh, so if you have five people in the band, you get five uh, 5,000 followers that generates $500,000 of income. That was their belief. It doesn't work. It, I mean, it was, it, it's a mantra. It, it, it's nonsense. Um, but what I think would work would be to make musicians salaried employees of record labels. So in the United States, 
they're independent contractors and it makes it so the the contract the record labels can avoid paying and avoid following labor law uh, so they don't have to pay musicians anything if we made them salaried employees then they'd work just like uh, the janitor, the receptionist, the vice presidents of the companies. Um, and since they're the ones that actually generate um, value for these massive corporations, it's the only way to get to a more equitable um, situation. So I'll read the several, the last final several sentences of the book, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Kim Marin. Um, so, quote, until musicians overcome the ideology of getting signed, they will continue to be stuck as contractors. As contractors, labels do not owe anything to rec recording artists that is not in the contract. By believing that record contracts allow musicians to flourish, the ideology of getting signed ensures their exploitation. Thank you, and I look forward to a discussion with you. Thank, thank you so much, David. That was so interesting. That was so interesting, um, especially coming um, from the Jamaican music scene. So much of that, when you go international, um, becomes it, the intersections. But before I bring in my own questions, let me take some of the questions um, from the Q and A and the chat. So please, you know, put up your questions. Um, I'm getting feedback, excellent, great presentation, David, if that helps. Um, one of the first questions was from Maria O'Brien, a colleague of ours um, in Dublin, that she wanted to hear more about your thoughts on a particular music argument, which is uh, Taylor Swift re-recording her back catalog and what does that tell about the continued power of labels? I, did, I thought that was a great controversial um, want to start with. I, thank you. Uh, I could probably write a book on that uh, um, episode alone um, uh, to where to start. So um, Taylor Swift, I find that whole episode uh, hugely ironic and her and, you know, Kanye West, they kind of work together in stoking um, controversy to make them more important and to promote their, their music. So um, the longer story, and part of this came from my research, I met with someone who is uh, in charge of the, the Bluebird. I probably mm -hmm. shouldn't say that, but because uh, I, I don't say that in the, in, in the book. Uh, but so I, I, I spoke with this woman from the Bluebird and this all gets to Taylor Swift. Um, basically, the story of Taylor Swift is, uh, you know, she was out there and, and this is the story that the, the Bluebird tells that, that she was discovered playing at the Bluebird, which is this uh, songwriting, they do songwriting circles. They have like three or four people. I went there in my research playing acoustic guitars and singing the songs that they write. Um, she was like 13 at the time, right? When in actuality, um, her dad is or was a CEO of a company, was very wealthy. They moved to Nashville, uh, I want to say from Pennsylvania. Um, and so they moved down there and uh, he met Scott Bruschetta uh, and Scott Bruschetta was saying, well, if you invest in big machine records, we'll make Taylor Swift the first uh, person on it. So lo and behold, that's what happens. Um, time goes by. Taylor Swift loves to do controversial things like uh, withhold her music from iTunes or withhold her music from, uh, cool. from Spotify yeah, and right. music. Uh, but then in the end, puts it on there anyway. Uh, which garners more attention, more controversy, and more streams. Um, so then, ultimately, Scott Bruschetta was selling Big Machine Records to Scooter Braun. Scooter Braun is Justin Bieber's manager. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, maybe real or fake bad blood there. Who knows? Um, and 
Scott Braschetta told her ahead of time, hey, this is going down. Granted, her father is a big investor in Big Machine Records and is going to make a lot of money from Big Machine being right. sold. Uh, so ultimately, it gets sold. She knew everything that was going on. She had an offer for to redo her contract. Um, and then she wait, She was like, nah, it's cool. Scott Bruschetta did a blog post about the whole history of this. And then after it was announced, it's when she feigned controversy and acted like, oh, this is this terrible thing. And Scott Bruschetta's like, well, you knew about it and you had nothing to say. And she had a better deal from um, Republic. So then she decided, oh, you know what I can do? I can re-record all my music and put it out there since I own the publishing rights, but I don't own the master recordings. Right. I can re-put it out there and make more money because it you know, makes my old music relevant once again. So I find the whole thing to be like a fake controversy to um, generate more Right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I feel like we just got the scoop. Um, just as a short, quick follow up, um, Paul O'Hagan had said, so um, had, is, are deals like these, you know, like the one that Taylor negotiated with Universal and Billy Bragg, where she retains rights ownership, is this a model that could be a viable artisan model um, for emerging artists? Uh, I don't think it's viable for emerging artists because I don't think they're going to do it. I think that because someone like Taylor Swift has so much uh, power um, that they only do that because that's what she, she would do to, to go on. They have, she has the negotiating uh, power, power. Yeah. So it's, it, the power is in her. So it's a power it's a power decision rather than a livelihood issue. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, lots of questions, so let me go on. Uh, Paul Stapleton um, had asked, you know, how do improvised music or other forms of music making that privilege live emergent processes over largely reproducible and recorded works fit within your theoretical arguments? I think the argument of the, the musician as employee salary, uh, I mean, people who are working uh, in a kind of improv improvisational space oftentimes don't have the same desires. So not everybody has the ideology of getting signed. One thing that I noticed is that the older musicians are, you know, and by older, I mean, maybe 22 years old, they start to figure out how inequitable the system is. And if they're not signed at that point, they tend not to want to be signed. And if record labels approach them they kind of um act a little different towards them and there's also a different route i mean when i think improvisational and maybe this isn't the best example um i like fish and you know they kind of do whatever they want to and that's part of their their shtick so a lot of times their recorded content's not as good as their live content mm -hmm. um yep so, you know, this, this is part of the story. You get into different genres. Clearly, it works differently in, say, jazz. Um, and those contracts work differently. They want to sign a record contract, but for, for different purposes, right? Because they want to be able to record and put, put it out there. It doesn't have the large advance. They're just trying to... Um, promote their live music so there are different interests right not all I, I wanted to before I go to the next question just throw in here that you know um, one of the music scenes I study is k-pop and you know they're because of just a very different um in our um, talent development pipeline the the artists are more or less employees of the company. And what you see is the other spectrum of how badly that can go as per employees, you know, in terms of low pay versus how much is earned. So I think there also, you know, needs to be a whole notion of, so what do those contracts look like? So they've had contracts over years, et cetera, but it's, it's been exploitative 
employee relationship. So it, I don't, you know, I would throw it back at you that does that solve the problem? There has to be other, um, other like, you know, salaried employees like what, you know, treated on the labor laws and how do we, the potential, how do we share the revenue yeah. above your salary? Uh, and to, and to follow up with that, um, the Hollywood studio system used to work like this, where an actor was part of a particular studio and they were there was a lot of exploitation that happened as a result and there was a lot of pushback. Um, part of my thought on salaried employers is, number one, musicians, if they don't sell enough albums, they don't get anything, right? So even crappy pay is better than no pay uh, would be kind of one point right um it puts them in a negotiating position but it also uh as a marxist allows them to create a uh collective sense of workers and maybe unionize and fight back against the label to create more equitable right so for me being a salaried employee is step one to becoming like a worker collective or something like right yeah. now people see themselves as independent silos so they can't break through in any kind of way and they can't you and and i should note that maria o'brien had noted about the hollywood the parallel with the hollywood studio system as well um and i Uh-oh. Hello? Did we okay. lose Kim? I think poor Kim is frozen. I know she was having computer difficulty earlier. So I'm okay. just going to jump in while hopefully she gets to rejoin us. Just to kind of, I'm conscious we have 10 minutes left. So I'm just going to pick up on other questions, if you don't mind. So one of the questions that I come up in uh, just I'm just looking at these in the kind of the sequence um, is have the have the record labels had their day? Are we post label with platforms like Spotify asks Anthony from QUB and there's a later question I'd just like to connect to this, which is questions around the future impact of Web 3.0. Um, and the new technologies uh, non non transferable fungible NTFs. Yeah. So uh, you and that. I mean, I can launch in on that. Um, basically, I don't think that it changes anything. Spotify in particular. Um, one of the things I'm actually working on right now is why music is different from video. Netflix has created all this original content. Spotify and Apple Music have been barred from creating original content, the way that they ended up licensing with the major record labels was the major record label said that Spotify could not produce its own artists. Um, and the major record labels actually got a, uh, uh, became not investors, but uh, they got equity in Spotify in order to license the content. Um, so that's why we haven't seen that. And if you want to put your own music on Spotify, you've got to go through a third party like CD Baby, and then um, you don't get promotional activity. So the thing that I think is most important in uh, the current digital nature of music is promotion and marketing. And that becomes even more important than it was before. And it's the major record labels and their uh, the independents that they distribute and have relationships with that have that marketing power. Whereas if you just put your music up on Spotify, nobody hears it. It's like a yeah. tree falling right. in the forest. And this connects to a question that we have from Giannis Zulakis, who's a researcher here at Queens, who is saying he was wondering if we could also see getting signed not only as a way to get rich and famous, but also as a more modest int intention to delegate labor and costs for a band and artist. So he's talking about developing media strategies, booking gigs, that so what you kind of talk about, the kind of marketing and communications power that comes from the record companies, is the getting signed partly that desire? Yeah, oh, de definitely. Um, but I, I would argue that people before they get in the game don't realize that that's what it is. So the ideology stems from oh, wow, I see uh, somebody huge on TV. I see Olivia Rodrigo, 
and she's huge. So I want to be huge. Let me follow her path through Disney uh, or, or whatever. Right. And that isn't, it's not apparent to people starting off that what the labels really offer is marketing and distribution. Um, even though that's, that's what they're best at. It, it's just, it's a, it, it makes them feel good. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to pick up. There's I'm, I'm reading between two different, the chat is going <laughs> a little bit lively and the questions are going a little bit lively and I want to get in kind of one last question. Um, so I'd just like to pick up. So could we talk a little bit more? Uh, Hyo Jung has a question in uh, the Q&A, which is actually talking about the different avenues. So she's referencing Pryor's work on the emergence of new amateurs. So the idea of these kind of new divergent semi-professional tracks. Hi, Kim, are you back with us? Yes. <laughs> so we're just picking up on Hyo Jung's question. So we've covered Giannis's and kind of a couple of others, and we're just getting to the last question. So um, how relevant, so Hyo Jung's question is, how relevant do you think the desire to getting signed to, is to musicians in the digital age, considering the divergence of career pathways? Yep. So again, in that chapter on uh, the digital turn, music uh, business as usual, um, the main thing that I argue is, it's just as important. It, it, uh, whether and and the data is there to to show it because all these uh, especially like the SoundCloud rapper phenomenon right like people become big um, whether that's uh, Juice World or um, I, I'm blanking sorry it's first thing in the morning here my brain's still not completely ticking um, you get all these people who then they're already building an audience and then labels use that almost as an a r function to say oh this is somebody big so then they pick them up and that artist doesn't need the label right if you already got a big following on soundcloud you could put your music on spotify you could chart because these people know who you are already um and, and you don't really need that support but they want it and they're they're signing these like four five million U.S. dollar deals uh, that are three sixty deals, so that um, the labels can try to get their touring, they can get their uh, merchandise, they can get all their their image profit off their image, they get all this stuff um, that they would have got on their own, and they could have their own manager that can negotiate these systems on their own again, but they think that that's what's going to get him. It, Lil Nas X is, is the, the quintessential person on this. He was huge. The label made him even bigger, but he didn't really need the label at all. The label needed him. Well, um, I, I can't answer the questions, Alice. I don't know if that question has come in that, you know, I, I wanted to throw in one where, again, coming from, um, coming from, my own research, particularly on reggae, um, you talk about the artists that could do well on their own. But I think, you know, in terms of access to markets, that's very much about artists coming from big, big markets and very much about Euro-American artists. So when you're talking about artists from, you know, even Latin America, well, Latin, you know, Latin America, no, not a good example, from the African continent or the Caribbean where their formal market is so small, one can see where the ideology of getting signed has some weight, but also the power dynamics is becoming even worse. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and this is primarily centered on the United States, a, a little bit on uh, the UK, just because I'm familiar with a lot of acts from, from across the pond. Um, so I, I think, it, no, no, I just, um, well, because I just came back in, I can't really see the ones before Alice. I don't know if there are any you want to throw in or, but I do see a uh, no, uh, comment from Paulo Hagan that came in about artists without label it was an interesting collective third party development skewered by the aggressive acquisition strategy of the industry. Yep. 
Any others, Ali, that had come in while I was um, no, technologically constantly. thrown Within off? Three minutes to two, there are people kind of yeah. heading to their next sessions um, in terms of our, our structure so our, or our timetable. So probably that this is the time to... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, but a very lively conversation and a very lively Q&A. Um, lots of comments in the chat. Um, just Lots of intersections. Um, I must say, I really like the whole notion of it disrupted how business is done, but it hasn't disrupted how the industry works. I will quote you. <laughs> uh, so I would, I would just like to thank everybody for attending. And if we haven't got to your question, um, if I, I had my email. Um, Ali and Kim both have my email address. Feel free to, to send me your email, to send me your questions, and I'd love to continue a, a dialogue. Or yeah. at David underscore RDT on Twitter. Very active. <laughs> yeah, right, and so the fine, last thing is to say thank you very much. And David, I'm, I'm really appreciative, of course. It's our lunch break. It's your very, very early morning start. Um, so we're really, really grateful for you straddling across time zones. Hopefully we'll get to host you in person at some point in the future. And thanks everyone for coming. Don't forget our next event is on the 15th November, 1 p.m. We have our annual showcase and anybody can sign up through the Eventbrite link. It'll be taking place on Zoom. Thank you so much. Thank you.